morning. Does your life ever feel like that? You ever feel a little out of control, wish you could control things a little better, fix something? Uh, maybe there's something right now that's, that you just wish, man, if, if only this would change, if I could change that person's political opinion, or if I could take care of that one person that's in Congress that I don't like, right? This is what people think they can control, things that are way out of control, and yet, just like Rodney said just a minute ago, the truth is, we need to look in the mirror, because we have an issue that John chapter 3 addresses. Um, let, me, let me just give you the series verse again for the last time. Next week, we're going to start a series called Holy Moses. We're going to talk about Moses, the life of Moses, and apply it to our lives. But our series verse for this series is Philippians 3.14. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So our goal is to see what does God have for me, what does he want for me. Our vision this year is that we want to help people feel seen and loved in 2021. Jesus made even people he didn't agree with feel loved, cared about. The Bible even says he looked at him and loved him. Somebody who did not agree with Jesus, who didn't like what Jesus said to him, Jesus still loved him. Boy, if that was true in our society, how our church could change the world. Now, there's a problem for us, and here it is. You ever wonder why you struggle with anger or frustration? You ever wonder why you get afraid instantly when something doesn't go the way you want it to or find yourself aggravated while driving when people don't drive the way you want them to? Not that I've ever done that. You ever frustrated about religious people who seem very religious and go to church and they're some of the meanest, worst tippers you've ever had? I used to work at Quincy's in Titusville. That is a known thing. By the way, it depended on the church. Some churches, uh, when they would come in, um, uh, the waitresses and waiters, we'd all talk to each other and say, you take them, they're terrible tippers, or you take them, that church is good tippers, or that's a good church, that's not a good church. Um, you ever wonder why people don't act like Christians? And do you ever get frustrated when you see someone else's behavior? And you think things like this, oh, I would never act that way. I, I would never do that. I can't believe they're doing that. When Jesus talks to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Nicodemus is a religious leader. He feels like he's got his act together. And John chapter 3 is a great chapter if you want to talk to somebody about what it means to be a Christian and if you as a believer are wondering why maybe you haven't felt like you're growing as a Christian. I believe John chapter 3 addresses all of that. It's a little bit tough. We're going to talk about that in a second, but here's what I want you to know. I have many tools in my shop and uh, my garage, which is my shop, right? Uh, uh, this one's my favorite. Now, I don't get to use it as much as I want to. This is a router, and I don't know if you know what a router does, but I'll explain it real quick. Basically, you can take a piece of wood or even a piece of furniture, like a, a table, and you can take the router and put it on the edge and fancy it up. That's a southern word for fancy it up. And so, and so you can take something that doesn't look that great and just add a little bit of extra look to it. Make it look a little extra special. Make it look a little better just by using the router. And here's what I think. I think most people and most religious people and even the people during Jesus' time felt like what God wanted was us to just fix up the edge, you know, make some things that we do, do some more religious things, give more, serve more. In the case of the Pharisees and Sadducees, wear longer tassels, carry big Bible verses on your head, uh, 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 stay away from people who uh, uh, might be dirty uh, spiritually, you know, give some space between them. They wanted to fix up the edge and make themselves look spiritual. But Jesus over and over said, you look good on the outside, but inside. At one time, Jesus looked at him and said, you're full of dead man's bones. And if we're not careful as believers, we can become Christians and then think that we just need to change the edge. But the truth is, when Jesus comes into your life, my dad used to all the time, we would, he would bid on a job, he was a contractor, he'd bid on a job, they would hire somebody cheaper, and then six months later they would call my dad 
and say, uh, they're not doing a very good job. And we would show up at a job site and see horrible work. And my dad would look at it and he would have to make a decision, do I fix this up or tear it down? And so many times my dad would give us a sawzall. They weren't battery powered back then. A lot funner now. Or a sledgehammer, and we'd go in and tear everything out. Why? Because we needed to start over, because it was such a mess. Too many believers think that God wants to do a renovation, but God wants to do a demolition. And now we don't like that, because that sounds harsh and terrible, but it's the truth. And in John chapter 3, this is what freaked Nicodemus out. It wasn't even the fact that Nicodemus, I really believe Nicodemus understood what Jesus was saying, but he just couldn't believe it. See, we want safe Christianity where we can tell people, well, if you can just control your thoughts, if you'll just be nicer in traffic, if you'll just, you know, whatever it is, if you, and we typically want to do behavior modification instead of having God tear everything down. So today may step on your toes at a few points, and I hope it does, whether you've been a Christian a long time or whether you're not a Christian, because there's too many people who think they're Christians just because they've done some religious activity and fixed the corner, and maybe they have some, a list of things that they do, but they've never allowed the God of the universe to enter their life and tear out all the old flesh and replace it with the Spirit. And that's what John chapter 3 is about. God wants to give us an entirely new direction. And it's not always easy to surrender. But when we do, what does he do? He tears everything out and rebuilds better. No longer do we have a flesh, we walk in the Spirit. So when you want God's direction, here's some things you have to do. Number one, repent of the desire to control. Let me show you how this story talks about that. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now remember, this is going to be the same group that basically looks at Jesus and they're jealous of him and they, they push him towards the cross and, and basically they have him crucified. They, through the Roman government, work that out for that to happen. And he is part of that. He came to Jesus at night. Now every single commentary says, you don't come visit people at night during that time. Night was dark. Night was dangerous. Night was where you could get killed. You, you locked yourself in your house at night. You did not go roaming about at night. But he was so worried about his reputation that even though he wanted to ask Jesus questions, he wanted to be safe. He wanted to control how other people saw him. Rabbi, he says, you know, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Now, the other religious leaders would not agree with that statement, by the way. And then it continues. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus comes and says, you know, you've done some good things. And uh, is there something you want us to do? And Jesus comes in and says, yeah, tear it all down. What? Tear it all down. Everything you want, everything you desire, all those things that you think are important. So Nicodemus asks, surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born. Listen. Of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Nicodemus is coming and he's saying, hey, what can I do? What can I change on the outside? Is there some things that I can do to make me more spiritual? And Jesus says, hey, get rid of the flesh. Surrender to the spirit. Now that's tough. Because the truth is, what do we like to teach? Well, we want to teach you about behavior modification because it's easier to see. It makes you feel good if the pastor says, just be careful how you think. Just be careful. Be nice to people. Love people. All, all that. And that's all very true. But the truth is, 
if you do all of those things and the inside has not changed, you will do it with a selfish and self-centered motivation. And the truth is, you will be an angry, frustrated, irritated Christian. Why? Because when you do something and people don't appreciate it, you get upset. Why? Because you didn't do it for God, you did it for you so people could recognize you. We like control. We want to control what people think about us. We want to control what people feel about us. When we tell a story about being wronged, we don't tell the other side of the story. We tell our side of the story, right? Just a few chapters later in John chapter 7, the guards go to get Jesus. He's in the temple teaching, and the temple leaders say, go get him. The guards show up. Jesus is teaching. The guards come back. And the religious leaders say, why didn't you get him? They're like, because he's awesome. They didn't say that, but that's my 80s, you know, version. They had listened to him and they said, this, we're not going to get him. Nicodemus then says to the other guys, let me read it directly. He says, does our law con condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? Nicodemus, in front of his religious friends, loses a little bit of control. He stands up for Jesus for the first time. Now, I don't believe Nicodemus was a Christian yet because we don't hear Nicodemus defend Jesus in the trial, although he was most likely there. And we'll talk about what happens to Nicodemus a little bit later. But Nicodemus says this, and then they look at him and they say, Are you from Galilee too? You'll find a prophet doesn't come from Galilee. They look, his friends look at Nicodemus when he defends Jesus and now you have to realize, saying somebody is from Galilee is an insult. And I was trying to think of what to compare it to. Do I compare it to being from Mims? Sorry, Suzanne. Do I compare it to being from Canaveral Groves? Sorry. Do I compare it to being from Cocoa Beach? You know, what? A, what a, Bithlow, maybe Bithlow. Let's go with, even people in Bithlow are like, yes. Yes. So they look at him and they say, what, are you a hillbilly too? Are you an idiot too? Maybe you're like Jesus. Maybe you're like him. They insulted him. Why? Because he began to take a stand and ask questions. What was happening? He was realizing that the outside didn't matter so much. He, he began to not be so worried about what people thought. One of the biggest changes that will happen in your life when you really give your life and surrender to God is you'll be more concerned about what God thinks than what other people think. And that's pretty easy to evaluate during your week. So here's the first question. Do I have any areas of control? Now, a few months ago, I told a story about our Toyota hybrid. My wife was sitting in traffic with her foot on the brake, and all of a sudden, the car started rolling forward. Apparently, it's a known defect with Toyota. So they took it in for free, thankfully, and fixed the car and said, this will never happen again. This week, I was grounded because one of my kids had a fever and a deep cough. You, you, under, you know where I'm going. So the pastor got grounded because of his children. I haven't been grounded since high school. It was frustrating. Couldn't go anywhere. Well, she tested. Tested not only did she test negative, she tested positive for basically a flu. And now it's like, oh, you got the flu? Good. Go back to school. You remember how it used to be the other way? So I take her to school, and then I'm on the way home. As I'm on the way home, thank God I'm a hungry person. So I pull into PDQ. I had heard it was really good. I like Chick-fil-A better. But anyway, so the Christian chicken's better, I'm just saying. But, uh, so so Jesus, Jesus would eat Chick-fil-A, I'm just saying. So, so anyway, so I, I pull into the PDQ. I'm sitting there. I get the bag, and all of a sudden, the same thing starts to happen. The lights come on on my dash, the brakes. I get on Highway 50, and now the brakes are out, and I am pumping the brakes to get home. I get all the way home. Of course, I called Toyota, called the thing, got my car towed to the dealership. Toyota National said this, we're sorry that happened. I said, well, are you going to buy my car or do something so that I don't? I said, I can't drive this car anymore. No, no, but we'll fix it so it doesn't happen again. But you told me that five months ago. I said, if one of my children was driving, they would have died. They would have not known to pump the brakes. I grew up in the 80s when you were used to brakes not working. Especially if you had an old truck like I did. You'd, 
That was like half the time. So you learn to do that. But my kids wouldn't know to do it. They just push harder. And they would have been into traffic and maybe gotten killed. And they said, we're sorry, sir. You can go see the lemon laws in your state. Maybe in the next 60 days, they'll make a ruling for you. Oh, thank you, Toyota. I love you too. Now, what rose up inside of me, do you know? Anger, frustration. Why? I can't control this. I can't fix this. They're trying to kill me, right? All of those things, all of those frustrations. And I had to say, God, you know what I should do. You know what should happen. Even this, although I'm going to take action, even this I have to turn over to you. What in your life can you not control that you're feeling anger, anger, frustration, irritation about? Can you turn that over to God? Number two, believe the words of Christ. Listen to what Jesus says next. Jesus, listen, what Jesus is saying early in the book of John is so amazing when you realize he was going to the cross. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify what we've seen, but you don't accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Jesus is referring to the idea that he would use human things for heavenly metaphors. You know, we use movies to teach a lesson. Oh, but that's an earthly thing. So is a tree. <laughs> and so he used earthly things. Why? To teach spiritual principles. And then he says, no one's ever gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Now listen to this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. You ever been to a doctor's office and seen the snake on the stick? If you look that up, it'll tell you it's from the Greek God, blah, blah, blah. But you know where the Greeks got it? From Moses. Who during one time when they were wandering in the wilderness, the people had disobeyed again. And, and, they were getting, and Moses lifted up this bronze snake on a pole. And when they looked at it, they were healed. They were saved. Jesus is now comparing what he was about to do, salvation, when you look towards him. He continues in the wilderness. So the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And here is the most quoted verse in Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the gospel in a sentence. If you want to talk to somebody about what it means to be a Christian, that verse gives the synopsis of what it means to be a believer. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for your sins. And when you believe, when you put your faith in him, not when you just let him change your outside attitudes, I, I, I'll let him mess with this part, but I'm not going to let him mess with that part of my life. No, no, no. When you allow him to come in, when you believe in him and you surrender your life to him, You'll have eternal life. One day Eric will hit his brakes and they won't work and you guys will come to my funeral and you'll cry maybe or laugh. Maybe both. But I know that I'll go from here straight to heaven. I'll say, oh no, a car. Hey Jesus, what are you doing here in the... Oh, right? None of us know. We don't have control. But when we surrender to Christ, we also don't have to worry. Because he's got us in his hands. Do I believe that Jesus is the way to God? Why do I believe that? Because that's what Jesus said about himself. I believe Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus didn't say there were many paths to heaven. He didn't say there's a lot of ways. He didn't say be good, do more, give a lot of money to the church. I looked for that many times. But he did say surrender everything to him. Tear it all down. Do I really believe what he said? Is there anything I'm holding back? Number three, finally, put your faith, your belief in Christ. After chapter 7, the next time we see Nicodemus is in chapter 19. When Jesus is taken off a cross, apparently Nicodemus was there. Because Nicodemus went home and he got all the spices prepared, either for himself or for somebody else's burial, and he brought what was probably thousands and thousands of dollars worth of spices. And he and Joseph of Arimathea carried Jesus' body to the tomb 
and wrapped it up. I believe that at that point, Nicodemus recognized who Jesus was. He didn't care what anybody else thought. He didn't care what the Pharisees thought about him being part of the burial. He didn't care what his friends thought. He said, regardless of all that, I'm going to be obedient and do what God's called me to do. I believe that Nicodemus became a Christian. And when you and I get to heaven, we'll get to ask him questions about what happened next. Here's what Jesus continues. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Life has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so it may be seen plainly that what they've done has been done in the sight of God. Let me tell you what that's saying. People love to say that people are genuinely good in themselves. The Bible disagrees with that. In our flesh, we are selfish and self-centered. Even our best actions in our flesh are selfish. Even when we do that nice thing, what do we do? We're looking for kickback. We're looking for praise. We're looking for encouragement. Car dealers looking for extra money when he writes his contract a little funky. Heard that story last night. Looking for selfish and self-centered. But when we really surrender to God and we allow his light to penetrate us, he takes out all the old junk. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have habits sometimes that sneak back in. We've got those old habits, but the truth is he's made us new. And whenever you find those old habits sneaking in, you know what you got to do? You got to do what you did at the beginning. Expose it to the light. Father, I realize that I've been struggling with anger. God, I realize that I've been struggling with control. God, I realize that I've been struggling with worry and fear. God, I realize that I've been struggling. You fill in the blank for you. And you expose it to his light. and Let him tear that down. Let him change you from the inside out. He can change who you are, not just what you do. So that you care so much less about what people think and so much more about what God thinks. Here's the final question today for those here and those watching online. Have I surrendered my life to Christ? The biggest question you can ever ask is, have I done what John 3.16 says, recognized who Jesus is and said, Jesus, I believe you died on a cross. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I am messed up. By the way, never. I've only one time in my life had anybody argue with me about being a sinner. Most people are like, "Uh uh-huh. You're a sinner. They don't go, no, I'm not. No, everybody's like, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm good at it. I'm a professional. I had somebody tell me they were a professional. And then somebody one day said to me, Eric, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give my life to Christ and turn my life around 360 degrees. No, 180, not, don't, that's just a loop. We have to do a 180. Say, God, I'm tired of living for myself. I want to surrender my life to you. That's what it means to be a Christian. To know that Jesus died and rose again to pay for your sins and my sins. And when you receive his free gift, the Bible says you're forgiven. And he takes out the old and puts in his spirit. And when you've been a Christian for a while, sometimes you have to be reminded of John chapter 3. Maybe today you should get that chapter out and just read it. Maybe if you're talking to a friend about what it means to be a Christian, you take that chapter out and just read it again. And maybe if somebody asks you questions, you take John chapter 3 and just talk about it with them a little bit. I believe that God wants to do a great work in us and through us. But we can't just commit ourselves to sin management. We have to, through His Spirit, let Him take out the old And put in the new. Take out our flesh and put in his spirit. Take out our selfishness and put in his love. If you're here today or you're watching online and you want to give your life to Christ today. You're ready to surrender. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. If you've been a Christian for a while and the truth is you've let those old habits sneak in. Hey, expose them to the light. Be honest with God. Confess your sins to him. He is faithful and will forgive you 
And as a Christian, he'll also, through his spirit, give you the power to overcome. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for your power. I thank you for your love. Father, it's so easy sometimes to just want to fix our outside and not allow you to change our inside. But I pray, just as your word says, we would allow your spirit to bring its light into the deepest depths of our hearts, into our behaviors, into our understandings, into our fallacies. Lord, that we won't be able to look at other people and see how sinful they are because we realize, but for the grace of God go I. And so, Lord, I pray if anyone here watching or online or here today has never surrendered their life to you, that today would be the day. I pray also for those who have surrendered their life to you, but Father, lately they've been walking in the flesh and the old ways of doing things. I pray they would allow you to expose all of those things to the light and renew them. Thank you for renewing our hearts and our minds in you. We thank you for these moments. Bless each one. In Jesus' name, amen.